Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, does county redistricting plan help up county residents? Montgomery County considers a guaranteed income pilot project. Skimpflation, what a lovely new word. I think we're going to need to get used to it. And do you want your daughters drafted to fight in foreign wars? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind these stories. We're joined by education activist Cynthia Rubenstein and Secretary for the Montgomery County Federation of Republican Women, Lori Halverson. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Welcome back. When you were a child, did you ever play the game Tiddlywinks, where you throw a bunch of multicolored discs onto a table and then shoot the disc into a bucket in order to separate the colors? Well, that's essentially what the county's been doing the past 10 months while drawing up the new seven councilmanic districts authorized last November when the county charter was amended to create two additional seats. The resulting draft map creates seven districts of roughly 150,000 people each and will be submitted to the county council for approval. Cynthia, the impetus for adding two additional seats came mostly from the up county areas that believe they were lacking representation. Does the proposed map accomplish greater, greater excuse me, representation for the up county areas? I, it, it does. It includes a representation for the up county it also includes um representation more representation for a part of the county that has been long neglected and underrepresented and that's the east county area which includes cloverly and fairland and burtonsville and white oak um, and mitchellville so i think that is one of the biggest improvements in the redistricting's work in making a district out of that area which has not received the attention it deserves, and now we'll be able to elect someone to help uh, remedy that problem. But wasn't that part of old District 4? I mean, I mean, it's not like it didn't have representation. It did, but it was diffused. And that District 4 has a couple of, has multiple constituencies. What having a separate, district for the East County does is more directly um, addressing the unique problems and issues that that part of the county has. Well, let, let's go to Lori. And so, Lori, this is basically the same question. You know, do, does the redrawn council uh, district map provide greater representation for the up county areas? You know, I think it's, it splits the up county uh, and, I, and that was the purpose for, for doing this. And it's, I think the focus was on the wrong thing. I noticed in the articles and things about it that there was a lot of focus on trying to put different ethnic groups together and trying to um, distribute it more about an ethnic ethic ethnic issue, not based on uh, the semantics of the communities. <clears throat> so I think there was wrong focus on that, and I think there was a specific focus to have uh, to again uh, make it harder for a Republican to win. You notice, like in every area where there's a larger majority of, you know, well, not majority, but you see more Republicans, then you add like Chevy Chase is in there with Potomac. Um, you know, you see a lot of areas where they're together, um, where they're adding a heavily uh, Democrat area into it. So it makes it harder for a Republican to win. So, um, I, and there are only two uh, Republicans on the commission, which I knew from the start, it was going to be really tough uh, when their representation on the commission was not equal. Um, there is more equal representation at the state level with their districts. So I'm not sure why they did the, you know, had it distributed the way they did, um, possibly because they think, well, they should have more Democrats on the commission since there are more Democrats in the county. But uh, I think that the result is now showing <laughs> that it's still going to be harder for Republican to win. I think um, Damascus is, is, is not getting the right um, representation. They're separated from Poolsville. Um, but I do, I do think there is a little bit of represent, more representation in the Poolsville area um, that it might be helpful to them. So. Well, you know, I got to tell you, when I first looked at that map, yeah. <laughs> the, the newly drawn map, I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, it still seems uh, very weighted towards uh, 
down county. Um, and uh, it just, I just thought, I'm not sure this accomplished what was intended by the proponents of changing the, the charter. Um, it, it looks to me like there are five districts that'll be, that represent down county and maybe two that have, that touch uh, up county. So. Yeah, well, it was but that's, but right, that's so, no, that's I'm sorry. No, I understand, I understand that the demographics are such, but. And the densities and the densities. Yeah, of I get it. Yeah, but, I yeah but it was a six to five vote. And so it shows that there was, um, you know, not a, a, a very strong feeling about this, <laughs> about this particular map one, uh, but, and they all agreed it was a compromise map so that not everyone is happy with this, with the result. But I think the Republicans really lose with this one. Well, well, we'll see, you know, we'll see next November when, the, when the, their yeah. election. Well, and you can provide public comment to the county council. So look for that when they're looking for a public comment. So it's not over yet. The county council has to vote on it. Well, yeah, I, I get it. But I, I, I doubt given the time schedules, there, uh, I doubt that the council is going to send this back for amendment because things have to be in place. We already have candidates announced for many of the districts. Uh, uh, former panelist Malcolm Bal Marilyn Balcom, who's been on our show a couple of times, uh, who was just awarded uh, a award for Montgomery County business person, one of the Montgomery County business persons of the year, uh, you know, uh, talks about the need to represent business. And uh, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, there's enough uh, uh, candidates who support that, that belief. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to go to our next topic, which is really kind of a fascinating topic, given, given the times. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over, over the stimulus payments that people are receiving. And the concept of a universal guaranteed income has been expanded across the United States. And 20 cities have adopted similar programs. This week, uh, County Council members Gabe Albernez and Will Jawanda proposed passage of a guaranteed income pilot program, which would provide monthly payments of $800 or $9,600 a year to, need, to 300 needy households. Now, I'll, I'm just gonna give you a brief uh, overview of what a guaranteed income program is. It's a type of cash transfer program that provides continuous, unconditional, unrestricted cash transfers to individuals or households. And this is supposed to differ from typical safety net programs by providing steady predictable streams of cash to recipients to spend however they see fit without limitations. It sounds like welfare to me, but uh, I'm going to ask Lori. Lori, proponents say this is that a guaranteed income is meant to supplement rather than replace. Is this a good idea? I don't think so. Uh, and I think, you know, the idea, and it's, it's plain and simple, 20 cities are piloting this and uh, the goal is to make it a federal policy. So this is a way to make government bigger, which I don't approve. And you know the saying, if you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you, get, if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Uh, I feel like this is feeding um, someone for a day uh, and it may solve some short-term um, anxieties and problems that a family may have. Of course, you know, you give someone 800 bucks, it's gonna help them for a little while, but is it really gonna get them out of poverty? I, I don't. I don't think so. And they they use Stockton, California, as an example of oh, we should do it because Stockton's doing it and having great results. Well, they started it um, during the pandemic, so they, the results are kind of hard. It, it does not show. It does not prove that poverty is is helped. It only proves short term um, issues are resolved to some to some extent, um, and it's it's not proof. So they, they, I think we need more evidence that it's something like this would work. And really it's, you know, even in the depression, I don't think, you know, I didn't live back then, but I, I, I think it would, the, the incentives were to get people jobs, not to give them money. So, you know, they did have programs that provided more support for people. Um, but I just don't think that giving people money is the answer and it makes government bigger. And of course, as you see, we're hemorrhaging here with money in this country. Even our, our county executive is saying, um, that we're in great shape because we have a lot of uh, federal funding through the pandemic. Uh, and to hear him say that makes me just think, okay, if he's saying we're in great shape, something's wrong here. We, we, we always need to have some issue where we need like, oh, you're not getting enough, you know, because you're- Well, the, you're gravy, the, gravy, the federal gravy train may run out at some point. And yeah. Cynthia, uh, we're going to discuss later in, an, uh, in a later segment 
about uh, existing government incentives that might be blamed for uh, keeping people from going to work. But is, is a guaranteed income, uh, will that exacerbate the problem? Well, I, I don't think we know, but I want to bring up some um, positive trend lines, this pilot in Stockton, and they found out it's a two-year program. They're, they've completed one year. One thing that they found is that it has improved participants' job prospects. There's been a 12% rise in the participants being able to find full-time work. It has done things like help a guy fix his truck so that he could go to work and to get out of debt. So, you know, there are some positive things that are already um, surfacing in that particular pilot program. So I think it's worth, um, worth trying out in multiple jurisdictions to see how it does raise time employment and enable people to go out and look for jobs to get out of debt. Well, you know what? again, I, it just sort of seems like you know a free pass right now because we have you know surpluses from the federal government and and donations that are supporting this particular program as as being proposed. But at some point, you know, if you do if you do the math, you know, three hundred families times nine thousand nine thousand dollars a year if you you know or you, if you start trying to expand that that that's going to hit the county ca county's budget at some point and is that's really the best means of encouraging people to uh, well you have to ask you have to ask yourself it is very it's direct and the participants decide how to spend how to apply the money rather than a participant who may be in dire straits and has to go to this agency, that age, this one for, for food nutrition, this one for rental assistance, this one for something else, that one for something else. There's no accountability. And in Stockton, they there gave is accountability in the Stockton no, program. No strings attached. And how are you going to pick the well, 300 families when there's, you know, thousands who are who are poor and need help? Um, they they need to be taught other things. Well, let, let, why don't they put I'm money? I'm so into a surprised program? to hear you say something about accountability when I always thought the conservatives were all about people being able to make their own decisions upon where about where to um, where to spend income. Well, it's not their money, Cynthia. It's their it's, problems. It's, it's 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 not exactly so their are, money. So, are you saying you like the social safety net, where you know there's this agency, that agency, this nonprofit, that nonprofit, filtering the money? Well, what, what it's it, why why is that a bad system, Cynthia? It's it well, it's not direct. And how do we know if this is going to be a successful pilot? What are the well, we don't know going to be? Well, we don't know. Too, one because, year well, into a two year. If they just say, well, oh, uh -huh. I felt better and I was, you know, my anxiety was Lori, Lori, I hate cutting you, I hate cutting you disaster. off. We got, we got to go to a hard break. And okay. I think you both, you know, articulated your, your points on this. It is a pilot project. It hasn't been approved. You have opportunities to express yourself right. uh, uh, to the county council when it comes up. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it looks like there is support for it because the county executive did come out in favor of it. But when we come back from this short break, in the name of equality, should women have to register for the draft and be forced to fight in foreign wars? Stay tuned. And welcome back. Last week, the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee uh, passed a provision to, to be included in the National Defense Authorization Act that would require women to register with the Selective Service Administration for the military draft. Uh, and if they're going to college, it's kind of an interesting uh, proposal. Cynthia, in the name of equality, should women have to register for the draft and be forced to fight in foreign wars? Well, the simple answer would be yes, but there are nuances to it. I mean, number one, um, today's foreign wars are not your grandfather's or your father's foreign wars. They, they um, take more brain than brawn, and so women... Are, are valuable, could be are valuable members of the armed forces. Um, they're valuable members now as volunteers and careerists. Um, I think there are some nuances to this that have to be examined and that have to do with the inequities in women's roles with family obligations, et cetera. 
Um, but on the face, I think it's definitely worth consideration for the sake of equality. Well, there, there are a lot of wounded war veterans from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan who don't, who don't believe that over the horizon warfare is the only way wars are being fought. And I think, you know, uh, we, we, if, we're, if we're gonna say women are gonna have a role and, we, and women are volunteering to be in, in uh, the SEALs and other special forces teams, uh, uh, they, I don't know if any have been successful in passing through the rigorous training, but women are well, gonna- Well, some of those women are gonna be drafted, they're gonna fight. Yes. Not, Lori, what do you think? I heard a fantastic speech from Jesse Jane Duff, who is a retired female Marine. And she really makes the case to say that no, women should not be in combat. Women are not made physically the same way as men. It's a fact, it is physically proven. They have 40, women have 40 to 45% less muscle mass. They have 20% less lung capacity than men. Um, they should not be in combat. It is, um, they, can, they have more likelihood for compression fractures, for muscle, um, muscle damage and um, shoulder and spine injuries. It's just not, um, it, and you, you better bet that the Chinese would love to see us pass this because when, if they're women, they're gonna, they're, women are at a huge disadvantage in combat. I, can, I, can, I agree that there are ways that women can help, but they should not be in the draft, they should not be in combat. This is not, a, this is not the time to be um, a female suffragist kind of person. This is something that is actual fact. We need to protect our women, women's rights on this issue. Well, women's, the women's physicality question is something to consider for certain types of service, but so much of, armed conflict is less boots on the ground and and warfare has become much more technology. So do you agree, Cynthia, and that we should not be in combat? No, I think there are roles in combat for women. There are women in combat now and have been. There have been women in combat since the freaking Crusades. And if that wasn't physical, I don't know what was. <laughs> well, well, when, they, when, I, you, when they're put up to the rigorous tests, uh, women, women most like most women will fail. I think in, in the, the uh, marine tests, uh, a woman has almost passed but has not been able to. And that is work. why there are, and that is why there are training pro programs that are to that are set up to match the requirements of the duties. Well, you know, the uh, is part, 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 and the part of this is an is academic different. discussion because we because we haven't employed the draft in in nearly three decades. Right. But, I uh, don't see it coming. But uh, there. Well, I, I think period there certainly <laughs> could be an op, a time when, when we have another draft. And that's why we continue to keep the draft. I mean, the, the draft's not an acronym because we want to have uh, a ready availability of of young uh young people who would be available to serve. And what happens to the kids? What if they're what if they're moms and they have children and they have to go to combat or get drafted? Well, that's the that's the nuance that I mentioned earlier. I think you know, there, there, more there, are men, there are men who are 18 who have children and yes. would, would be forced to go, you know, would be forced to serve if they're if they were drafted. So uh this is this is an issue. Uh, I think it's kind of fascinating uh the, the dividing line that uh, that is being drawn on whether or not to, to support this proposal. Uh, when we we got to come go on to our next uh, topic, and I, I jokingly said during the during the break that Lyndon Johnson gave us inflation, Jimmy Carter gave us stagflation, and now we have a brand new, wonderful, beautiful world called skimpflation, which Joe Biden has given us. Now, supply chain problems have been in the news of late, and. As, a, as inflation and other large number of Americans are opting out of, out of the workforce. And the real reason that inflation seems worse than the government and the media is, is uh, uh, discussing is this great word I found on the internet. It's called skimpflation. And it, it's a lovely word. It describes how businesses are forced to cut back on services and products because of shortages in labor, inventory, and increases in costs. So, uh, Lori, we see it all around us. You know, ga gas and food prices are up. Stores are poorly stocked. You can't go into a, a CVS or a pharmacy and not see empty shelves. 
and businesses, they can't offer the same level of, of services. So is this just a transitory pro problem as our Secretary of Treasury has described? As long as the Biden administration keeps hemorrhaging all this money into our um, economy, we're going to see continued shortages and inflation. It is, it, it, we're seeing it now, and it'll just keep getting worse as long as they keep you know, passing all of these um, stimulus things. And I mean, it's just, um, it's so obvious what's happening and all of us are experiencing problems. I mean, you, you go to a hotel anymore, it's becoming the norm to not expect a, a maid to come and, uh, you know, make your bed over, you know, and check your room in between the, your days. I mean, you have to wait till you leave for them to actually um, clean the room. I mean, uh, you know, re uh, there's, um, there's a lot of problems. I want to get to Cynthia on this. And yeah. Cynthia, you know, uh, we've seen that the U.S. economy grew at a 2% uh, rate in the last quarter, and rather than the predicted 2.7%, in addition to all the other problems that we just discussed. So uh, who's to blame for all these problems? Well, we're talking about the quarter, which was July, August, and September. And we all still remember, and it's still fresh in my mind at least, that Delta came roaring in and that's the primary reason for the quashing of the growth because people were not confident and people were afraid to do stuff. So I wanna point up a comment made um, by the chief economist from the National Association of Manufacturers, not known as a left-wing group, but known as a very conservative group. And their chief economist predicts 4% growth for the last quarter and for all of 2021, an overall growth rate of 5.5%. Another thing that is promising is that can now, we have a, can we have now a that the pandemic forward? is lifting and vaccination rates are rising, the people are buying less stuff and having more experiences. So live entertainment, sporting events, restaurants, movies, travel, hotels, and that's what's going to continue to rise. So that is what's going to help improve. And I, this is not doom and gloom. We're going to end 2021 with a decent rate of growth and recovery. Laura, you got about 15 seconds to respond. Yeah, I just think, you know, I think a lot of us have been cutting slack to some of these businesses because we understand the shortages and it's really, really tough. We've got to really feel for all the people out there working so hard because those who are working deserve our business, deserve us to be, you know, it's just, well, we got to we got to wrap it up. We got to. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to have a bet on what what the final GDP number is, Cynthia. <laughs> I got yeah, well, the, the National under. Association got of Manufacturers. We got to we gotta go. There. Stay tuned for. We, I'm sorry. We got to go. Carolyn's screaming at me in my ear. Stay tuned <laughs> for parting shots. And welcome back. Now with parting shots, Cynthia Rubenstein. Well, my parting shot is um, regarding Montgomery County Public School teachers and support staff who have been slammed since classes resumed in person. Um, there are hundreds of um, positions that are open that haven't been filled in among teacher ranks and paraeducators. Uh, of course, we already know about the bus driver shortage, but um, they are literally buckling under the extra duties and protested this last week at uh, the Board of Education to amplify the conditions that they're operating under to make it known to the Board of Education, including the State Board of Education, um, what is going on. And I was in a middle school on um, Wednesday and it was evident. Thanks, thanks, Cynthia. Lori Halverson, your, your parting shot. Yeah, I'll follow up with what Cynthia was talking about, saying, you know, I really do um, have compassion for the teachers and what they're doing and, and, and doing all they can to help the kids. Um, but I do want to say that if, if you think about it, if it wasn't for the Republican governors in our country, we would be like Australia right now. Our kids would probably still be in lockdown in their homes. And if it wasn't for the, the innovation and ideas and following science carefully, these Republican governors have made great decisions. Governor Ron DeSantis, thank God for him. Otherwise, our economy would be really going down the tubes. He's opened up the ports. And because of that, we can thank a Republican governor for Christmas. Um, so 
That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. I know Cynthia would love to love to respond, but we, we but you can't, you can't. We're, we got to wrap it up. Next week, we're going to analyze the effects of the Virginia governor's election on Maryland. Already, the turnout at the polls has been outra outrageously strong. I want to thank you both for being here today. I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show for 21 this week. I'm Casey Aiken. 